right, in the meantime, let's just go ahead and get started. Jessica, are you ready? I am ready. Awesome. All right, so oh, just give me one second. <laughs> All right. So hello, everybody, and welcome to the MIT live Q&A session. My name is Karen, and I am the Associate Counselor here at Plexus. We are very happy to have someone here with us who is a current graduate student at MIT Sloan Business School, uh, here to answer all of your questions. Jessica, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, but first, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if you guys could turn on your cameras. Uh, I feel like very professory, or I don't know if it was indicated not to turn on the cameras. Um, it's actually, pref I mean, it is a good idea, but it's actually preferred not to just in case, just because some of these uh, students are minors. Uh, so like that way you'll have to get permission. So okay. Um, okay. yeah, good but like they are, they are welcome to turn on their cameras when they want to ask, when they want to ask you a question. Okay, awesome. Um, well, yeah, I mean, in form of introduction, my name is Jessica Leon, as um, Karen mentioned, and I am a first year, I just finished my first year MBA uh, at MIT Sloan. And I'm also now pursuing a co concurrent degree. So that means like at the same time at the Harvard Kennedy School for my master's of public policy. Um, but with that, you know, I want to share my story and hopefully it resonates with uh, some people. And Karen, let me know if it's like, this isn't this is the story part, um, but happy to kind of jump into that as well. Awesome, all right. So um, thank you for sharing, Jessica, and thank you for introducing yourself. Before we get started, I want to let you all know of how this session is going to work and the schedule throughout. So I will be kicking off this live Q&A with some questions for Jessica, just so we can get things warmed up. While I'm interviewing, feel free to start thinking of some questions on your, of your own and as well as you can start writing them down as well. Um, after I have finished interviewing Jessica, we will open up the floor to you all so you all can ask your questions and I will give you all more instructions on how you can ask your questions when we get to that point. All right, so with that said, let's just move on. Let's just start off with our first question, okay? So my first question for you is, I always wanna start by talking a little bit about your undergraduate career. Um, but before we get into questions about MIT, talk to us about your undergraduate career, such as where did you go? Uh, what did you study? How was your undergraduate student experience? Yeah, no, thank you. I guess I'll stay, I'll take a little bit of steps back on that. Um, I want to share with you my story for a little bit and also um, kind of tell you why this is so important. Um, so I was born and raised in Idaho, which is a, in Twin Falls, Idaho to be exact, which is a community, a very rural community uh, in the middle of the United States. I'm not sure where you guys are coming from, but sometimes people in the cities don't really understand what being part of middle America is. Uh, so born and raised there, my parents were immigrants, Mexican immigrants, and uh, they crossed the border. My dad crossed the border illegally uh, and then later became a resident and then my mom did as well. Uh, but this was a, kind of like a very low income family situation where I grew up and um, also without any sort of guidance and support of what I wanted to do or what I could do in the future. So I grew up there and then um, it was also, as, as I was there, like I had this Mexican identity because of my parents. I knew how to speak Spanish. I did not know how to speak English when I entered school. Then I learned how to speak English later on, but I had two identities. I was Mexican, but I was also American be being born here in the US. However, I did not look like the people that were uh, considered American. So I was too Mexican, I guess for the white people, but uh, too American for the Mexican people. And I was always kind of like in that uh, dilemma. Um, with that, I, um, I went, I pursued my high school. In high school, um, it was, uh, I, I signed up to as many programs as I could. Um, and that was just because I was curious. I wanted to like understand it. I signed up for programs that I thought were going to benefit me for my future, like resume workshops and whatnot. And then from there, I, my counselor pulled me aside and was like, hey, um, are you thinking about a school? I didn't know 
that I had to think about school. My parents never really embedded that in me. Like, well, they did say you need to go to school, but like, they didn't tell me how they didn't have the toolkit for that. They just told me I needed to be a doctor or a lawyer. And I was on the doctor route. And I uh, decided to um, go to my counselor. She told me that I should go do makeup because I knew how to do makeup well. And that um, maybe like school wasn't for me. And, uh, but you know, I could take the test because I had free lunch and it was not gonna cost me. So then I went and I took the test, uh, the ACT uh, to be exact. And um, I didn't know why people were preparing for that exam. Like people were like not sleeping, they were studying, like they were eating like certain like meals in the morning to like help their brain digest better. And I was just like, whatever, like, it's a test. Like, what are you talking about? Like, why are you preparing so much? Um, so I just went to the test. I got like a really low score. Um, but, you know, I then later attended a program for the Hispanic Youth Symposium, and it was tailored for uh, Hispanic students in Idaho. And uh, I was able to apply to scholarships in, um, in like undergraduate institutions where I applied to the University of Idaho. And that's where now the question is like, what is, what, uh, how was my undergraduate experience? So giving that context, um, going first, like going to undergrad, I had to convince my parents that I was going to go to a school that was an eight hour drive from where they live. They didn't under, they wanted me to go to school, but they did not understand the difference between the community college that was five minutes away and the school that I had selected, which was eight hours away. So it was, took a little bit of convincing. And then I um, applied to a whole bunch of scholarships. There's a lot of money out there, but you just need to apply. Like anything that had female, anything that had Hispanic, I applied and I got it. And then realized that people, a lot of money just gets left on the table because people are not applying to these opportunities um, or they just get distributed to other people. With that, I, um, I paid for a part of my school through scholarships and also student loans. And um, I decided to pursue my pre-med and also business because I was interested in both. And then from there, I, the freshman year of college, uh, my dad ended up getting um, involved in some like legal issues and he was deported to Mexico. And uh, then like my family was rattled, like I didn't really, know what to do because like the head of the household was gone like who was gonna support me like I knew like they couldn't really support me financially that much but still emotionally like if I were ever to need like two hundred dollars or something like they could send something to me like not a thousand or whatever but something and I didn't have that anymore in addition like I had to figure out how to help myself and also my sister in the way because like she still had a year left in high school and I needed to help her like finish and um, do that. So like we ended up moving together. She moved in with me in um, at the University of Idaho, and um, we figured out how to live life through like food stamps, um, student loans, and uh, grants and scholarships. So like it's doable. Like, but I knew that I needed to get this done because like my parents sacrificed their life their life crossing that desert is not you know something that you want to do to be here and for me to just quit why because yeah like this came up but so what like that's why they came here for for me to get this done um and then from there i um then she attended the university of idaho with me and i um i also was selected to go to this program in washington dc it was like my first time in Washington, D.C., and also my first time my, uh, going on a plane. And nobody really tells you about going on a plane, but like I didn't know that in a layover, you don't get off to change your luggage from one plane to the other plane. Uh, that, you know, it just does it automatically. Someone does it for you. And I ended up missing my flight, uh, but I, it was rebooked, and then I was able to go to uh, Washington, D.C., but in this conference, I was able to expand my network like in a national level. And then from there, um, you use it to bring it back to the University of Idaho. I leveraged it to start the Hispanic Business Club, which now is called the Association Latino of America. So it's like alpha. Um, and now they're working on developing and helping students that are pursuing business. 
And I made lifelong friendships. Like I, uh, the first summer of my freshman year, I didn't get an internship and I was disappointed, but I decided to, to do summer school. I wanted to advance. I wanted to take organic chemistry the next year. And uh, um, the next year I ended up getting an internship at, at um, the National Nuclear Security Administration. And um, from there, like, it was an amazing opportunity. I was making, like, I think $16 an hour, which I felt was amazing because I've never really met anyone that was making $16 an hour. And I was doing that. Uh, but it was just really boring. I was in the middle of New Mexico. And um, I decided to, uh, and how I got my internship is that I applied uh, to a program that the Hispanic uh, College Fund sent out. I think now they joined the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. Uh, but I was just like on these email lists and always looking and Googling and researching what some of these internship programs were. And then from there, I, uh, I saw my friends in New York and I was like, I want to be in New York. They're having so much fun. Uh, but then I asked my friend, like, how much money did you save? Because money is important. I need money. I am poor. And uh, he said, well, we saved like 3000 And uh, I was just like, what? I saved like 10,000 in New Mexico. Like, why would I go over there and um, take that job? That's ridiculous. Um, I decided to apply anyways, and I applied to SEO, uh, Sponsors for Education Opportunity, or Seizing Every Opportunity. And um, I applied to the career program. And this is a nonprofit in New York that supports people in high school through college in New York and San Francisco and also career in terms of helping people get into Wall Street, specifically the people of color. And they have a law program and also they have an alternative investment program. I did the career program and I interviewed with them and they um, somehow uh, like allowed me to be part of the program because I know I bombed that interview. Someone believed in me that I could be successful or that I could be there. And uh, I got an internship. I got an internship to go to Goldman Sachs. And I didn't really know what that was. Uh, I knew it was a bank, but um, what I knew what banking was, was a teller, like Wells Fargo, um, Chase, like that's what I knew. I got to New York, it was my first time in New York from Idaho. I looked everywhere and I'm just like, this is disgusting. Like, am I still in the United States? Like all these potholes and all these homeless people, like, what is this? This is in like trash everywhere. Like I grew up and like going to like Arizona and Nevada, like it was just not the same as those regions that I had uh, visited before. And, um, but I got to Goldman Sachs and I recall being like, there are no tellers here. I walked the lobby, there, were, there was not a single teller and I was confused. Then I found out that you need to have $10 million at least to have a bank account there. And they don't have tellers. Like they just have people that manage your money. And um, from there, it was an enlightening experience. Despite like the grossness of the city, I really loved the people. And I was motivated by the energy that the city provided and ultimately how motivated people were. And um, after my internship, I was lucky enough to get a full-time offer and I came back. And I came back to the University of Idaho and finished my school year. And I was one of the first Latinas to ever, I was the first person actually in my entire university to get a job on Wall Street right out of undergrad. Thank you for sharing. All right. Um, so from well Susan on the chat says that you had an amazing story you do have an amazing story um, and she also asked a question um, Susan we're going to get to your question I promise um, after I have finished the interview for um, Jessica so um, once I have finished the interview then I will be able to ask your question all right so the next question how did you prepare to apply to undergrad and how was it different from applying to MIT Sloan Business School I think the undergrad process, I did not have any clue. I was just applying, um, like I, I had other people that I thought had my best intentions to guide me, but they didn't really know how to, or they never really met someone like me. I don't know why they, they thought that maybe I wasn't 
uh, school material. But I knew that I wanted to do that. And just that drive and motivation that my parents wanted me to go to school, like allowed me to continue to keep asking these questions and to be persistent about it. And uh, um, I attended the conference called the Hispanic Youth Symposium. And I think the Hispanic Scholarship Fund still does it. And they, um, they went through it. And it's basically like my people, like Latino people teaching other Latino people how to apply to school and helping them get there. And that is honestly like the best way that I found, like just reaching out to people about it. The difference between MIT Sloan now is that I knew what I wanted to do. Like I already had an idea of like what was out there. And now I decide like what I'm gonna study. Before, like, regardless of who tell you, like, they have all their life planned out, like, no, nobody has their life planned out. And now, like, I had a better idea of, like, what I wanted to do in the future. The process was different, though, because in Idaho, I didn't know that I could apply to outside my state. I had no idea what was required of me, what type of application I needed to submit in order to be competitive in, like, Ivy League or, like, top universities. And I, through this, uh, through business school, I, um, my mentor kind of pushed me to apply to business school and I went to this dinner and um, there were people again that were willing to help me apply to this program and I asked and I uh, asked questions about how they got into the program. They looked like me. They came from similar communities like mine. I wanted to like just feed off of like all of their knowledge and they, they said they could help me. And they did, they walked me through the entire process. It took me three years to study for the test. The ACT, remember that I told you guys, like I didn't even study for, that I didn't understand what people were doing. The same thing over here, you take the GRE or the GMAT, it's a test that you need to go take in order to get to graduate school. And I studied for this, I paid for tutors, I spent over $10,000 and for now, it sounds like a lot of money, um, but like, compared to like what these schools have to offer, like it's worth it. Like that's what you are here, like telling them this is your return on investment and I'm investing in myself. So like I spent a lot of money on my exam and also like um, I had someone review my essays. I had someone read through things, someone that had already read my essays before. And this is like what they call admissions consultants. And uh, thankfully I went through a program that was a uh, like reduced rate and that they helped me pay for it. And uh, people even read my essays like for free that had gone through these programs and uh, were willing to help me go through it myself and just guide me. But like you, and this is the advice I would give you, you can't get anywhere without asking questions. Uh, that just means that you're not hungry. So like you can't uh, learn if you're not hungry. Thank you. Thank you for the advice also. Um, the next question, why did you decide to go on your career path? How did you figure out what you wanted to do? I mean, I still don't know what I want to do. I just had a conversation with, um, one of my friends uh, that is in an industry that I love, but I just don't know if I want to do. Um, I don't think anyone, anyone knows what they want to do. And let me repeat that again. Anyone, no one knows what they want to do. And those that say they do, they're lying to you. They're lying. And you don't need to have your life figured out on like exactly what you're interested in doing. Um, how I picked my career path was, you know, I guess a combination of luck, of loss, and really being real with myself in terms of what are my strengths and weaknesses. Right now, I have no job, so, but I, I have built a career in financial services and venture capital. And um, what that really is, financial services is helping basically rich people get richer and this is through like advising them and helping them like invest in companies or even um, doing things for, for the bank that just helps them not get a fine. And then um, at venture capital, venture capital is something that even people like now in graduate school don't even know what it is. 
it's Shark Tank, basically. If you guys know what Shark Tank is, like you have an idea, I give you money for your idea, and then I get part of the money from your idea. And um, I was interested in that because like, I'm very social. I like to talk all the time. I like to connect people with things. And as a venture capitalist, you're always connecting to people for either entrepreneurs to investors, to investors, to entrepreneurs and um, whatnot, like thought leaders. Like you're just talking to people all the time and seeing like what they're interested in. Um, and also I just, I feel like I have a little bit of ADHD where I just, so I'm always like, I like this, I'm like that, and I don't know what I should be focusing on. And um, as a venture capitalist, you get to see all these companies pitch to you. And like, these are new companies, like innovative solutions, very cool ideas. And it's just great to see that uh, joy and perseverance of these entrepreneurs. Um, but, you know, I did have to go through like financial services to understand that. That does not mean that's a path for everyone. Um, and like I started my career, like I lost my job where that was where really what I thought was like one of my biggest failure was like um, getting um, laid off from Goldman Sachs and being laid off is some concept that I wasn't aware of. I was like, was that fired? Like, what did I do wrong? And basically being laid off means that the, the firm by no reason of your own lets you go because they have, they don't need you. And I was buying renewable energy and they had to pay a $5 billion fine. They let me go because they didn't need me. But I was so confused because like I moved to New York for this job. I had to support my parents. And now I didn't have a job in this city with all this rent money that I had to pay. So I, um, I really felt like a failure, but it was honestly the best thing that's happened to me because then I realized I needed an MBA. All of these other jobs that I was trying to apply to were just MBA preferred. And also I had the University of Idaho, but I didn't feel like anyone in New York or anyone anywhere really knows what the University of Idaho is. So I wanted to develop that network um, and decided to, to pursue that uh, more intentionally. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. The next question. Um, how is it like being part of the MIT Sloan Business School student community? Talk to us about your experience at the university. Yeah, I mean, right now it's weird. Like everyone hates it because it's all online, um, but they are trying to do a hybrid model. Um, in terms of the community itself, like it's a builder community. If you are here to kind of be talked at and um, waiting for other people to take action, then this might not be a community for you. Like this is a community where you roll up your sleeves and you see a problem and you go fix it. Very true to like what their mascot is. So it's like the mascot, if you guys don't know, is a beaver. And the beaver is called Tim. And it's a beaver because a beavers are nature's engineer. And MIT is an engineering school. And Tim, what does it spell backwards? T-I-M backwards M-I-T. And uh, very much to, I know it's a nerdy joke, <laughs> but uh, very much to like what beavers are. It's like you're going to create things. You're going to um, roll up your sleeves and do things. You see a problem, you go fix it, and you have this organization behind you that is giving you resources to make it happen and people that are so supportive that are going to help that. And uh, um, in terms of like the, the rest of the community, like I think we're here in Massachusetts, um, in Cambridge, there's other amazing schools around here that you get to also not feed off, not only feed off the MIT ecosystem, but also the ecosystem that's around it. You have like Harvard, uh, Boston University, like. Dartmouth, like all of these things that are around that creates also for me that I'm interested in like tech ecosystem and also and then like all of this um, kind of like educational environment that you need in order to like grow your business or pursue whatever you want to pursue. Awesome. Um, I am going to ask you one more question um, since I do want to leave time for the students to ask you questions as well. The next question that I would like to ask you is what advice would you give prospective students at MIT Sloan Business School? 
I guess hopefully you guys apply. I know you guys are still on the younger age, but start studying for your test. There's programs that are called uh, two plus two programs that you can apply when you're a senior in an um, in undergrad and that allows you to be here. Also think about like why you're doing it. It's like, what is the purpose of it and um, what you're gonna get out of it? As an MBA, um, what I see the value of is the network, but also for some reason, people just think that I know more, um, but I don't know, I don't think I do. Um, I think that you need to um, really start working on like what your leadership roles are like what is it that you want to um pursue and this only this goes to like all graduate degree programs not only like business school but your leadership your community involvement and as you start your career or even in your undergrad like what are some initiatives that you're leading or uh, working on and just making sure that people at least know who you are and you're just not a silent member or a silent volunteer but actually doing something that is impactful uh, and that is really driving that change. Thank you, Jessica. So now we're going to open up the floor to questions that you all have, but before you do, I do want to give you all instructions on how you all can ask questions. First, you can ask questions by using the raised hand option. You can access it by clicking participants and the raised hand option should be right there. Of course, that involves turning on your mic and it will if you would like, and if you if you would like also, you can also turn on your video. Um, the second method is by sending your question to the chat. You can send it to the public chat or you can send it to me privately. I am my counselor, Karen, on the participants. Um, and like that, uh, you'll wait for me to ask a question to Jessica. Um, so let's just start off with our first question. This question is from Susan. She asked, how did you get your internship? Um, yeah, I think I, I answered this one as I was uh, going through my internship. I applied to different programs. Uh, I applied to the Hispanic Scholarship Fund and the Hispanic Scholarship Fund um, College Fund. And even I also got an internship for the Caucus Hispanic Congressional Institute. And um, there, like, you, you, there's like all these different organizations that provide it. There's also inroads. There's uh, SEO. SEO is the one that I got like, into Wall Street. Um, but you just need to look and, uh, really apply like Google, like Hispanic, um, internships, like start now and also think about, uh, like what you need that way you can start, you know, getting the letter of recommendations. If you need letter of recommendations, like start working on your essay, don't make it, the essay rushed and have someone review it. Like there's a writing center in your schools. Like there's people that want to help you. Like all the time I ask people, I'm like, let me help you. And nobody really reaches out to me. So it's like, reach out to people that you know are in your network that uh, are going to help you. But you need kind of like need to take uh, that step to do that. All right. And Paul had a question, but I see that you already answered it. Um, so any questions, keep them coming. Uh, you can also, oh, there we go. We have a raised hand from Victoria. Victoria, go ahead. Hi. Okay. Um, so my question is that um, as of today, and a pressure that I get a lot from my parents is to go straight to community college to get your associates and then go to a cheaper college to get the rest of your bachelor's. I'm curious as to what you see or to how you found out that you would prefer going to an Ivy League school. Like, where are the benefits there and what are the differences that you're looking at? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there and a lot to think about. Uh, of course, for like your situation and where you, you are, I decided to go to the University of Idaho, and this is like specifically to me, because I got into a program called CAMP, which is Campus Assistant Migrant Programs that helps sons and daughters of farm workers go to, um, go, go to like undergrad. And most of my school was paid. And I was like, you know what? Like, I'm only gonna have to take a couple of thousand dollars for loans. I ended up and of course, Idaho, like their tuition is like really low, but I ended up taking about um, $10,000 in loans. Mm -hmm. And which was like, not bad at all. Um, but like, 
in terms of like, and I, and I get this a lot, like that's what like my parents were like, go to the community college and then like go to on, um, on like a university. I thought about that. But now like a trend that I see with people is like they go to the um, community college and then they lose motivation. Like they don't really like see themselves or it's like then they transfer to the, the undergrad institution and then the four year university and then they have to make up some classes because they didn't transfer the same way. And it's just like, and then you lose like another year because like you're doing that. Um, I would just say, if you have an idea of what school you want, you get like these finances make sense to you, then I would go to a four year university. The caveat is, is if you are still like very, very like, I don't know what I want to do in college. I don't know what I want to major in. Like, I have no idea at all. Like what, if you have, a spark of like a North Star that you're like, this is kind of what I'm thinking of, then go to a four year university. But if you have like no idea about your parents wanted you to go to school, then maybe a community college is something to consider to try to figure that out. But I think going to a four year university allows you to also become more independent, like you move away from your parents. You're able to now, um, live by yourself, you're able to experience what being on a campus is and grow up and see like all of these things uh, with like your peers and sometimes people that went to your same high school. In terms of the Ivy League University and regular universities, this is where I like, I question myself like, would I be at MIT if I had gotten a, um, a degree from like Harvard? I don't know, or like Yale, I don't know. But I also see a lot of my friends here that graduated from the university that are here at MIT Sloan. So I'm just like, I don't know what that looks like, but I think, um, yeah, I, I also saw myself at, at uh, Goldman Sachs with having the same job as people that were like $120,000 in debt from their undergrad and because they went to the N NYU or something. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to University of Idaho, I had like 10,000. So it's like, we were in the same place. Why? Because I was gritty enough to like fight for what I wanted and really look for those opportunities myself and even that playing field. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I don't know if I answered that question. You did, thanks. <laughs> Awesome. We do have a question from Anya on the chat. Uh, she says she's heard that getting an MBA has many different traveling and networking opportunities. What were some opportunities you had at MIT? Did you ever get to travel? Well, Corona happened. So like everyone's very salty about that. So it sucks. Uh, but you know, that is one of the reasons to get an MBA is because you get to travel with your classmates and whatnot. But at the same time, it's kind of a blessing in disguise for me being a low income person because it was gonna be expensive. Like each one of those trips is like $4,000. And I just, you know, didn't really, I was gonna do it, but like it was still gonna be hard. Uh, but I think that um, I did go, I went to Hawaii and uh, I also went to Cuba and Colombia and uh, it was a great experience. Uh, I love just like networking and meeting people. And it's also like a different environment because like you're in class, but then you go and like uh, go and have fun together at like uh, a beach somewhere and enjoy each other's company and like really get to know who you are. And um, I think, you know, I, I had signed up to go to Israel and go to Tel Aviv and that didn't happen because of Corona. I was gonna to go to Japan uh, as well. And uh, unfortunately that wasn't the case, but I hope that maybe in the, in the spring it opens up. If not, you know, I have next year, I'm gonna do it because I'm doing two programs. It's gonna be three years, but um, yeah. And it also depends, right? Like, can you afford to go to these places? It's great, but you could also uh, network and build those relationships here. like. You could have intimate dinners. Like the other day I made mole and right now I'm actually like preparing to make um, enchiladas and I'm going to like host like a very intimate dinner because of Corona is going to be like five people or so. Um, 
to just make sure you know you're building those community and those like that network. All right, uh, let me know Anya if that answers your question. In the meantime, are there any other questions? Uh, so a reminder, you can raise your hand or you can uh, put your question in the chats. In the meantime, I do have a question for you. Sure. Um, how is the course workload? Like, do you think you have enough advising support on campus? <sighs> right now, I am like super stressed, uh, but in uh, graduate school, grades do not matter. And um, I am, yeah, I'm taking classes in like two schools and I'm also working part-time and uh, doing research. And it's just like a really busy time right now. But um, the school offers me like the support that I want. It's up to you to use it. And, I, it, and as an undergrad though, I really leverage the support more just because um, like in business school, like you're told that it's building those networks and connections that matter the most in a grade. And it's true. Um, I think for undergrad grades do matter and you should try to keep a high GPA. I used all of the resources available at my undergrad, including TRIO uh, and uh, student support services. So like I was like, they had tutoring. I took advantage of that tutoring every single hour, every tutor that I could get for every class. And it really helped me just, even if I didn't understand it, like be accountable of studying because it's so easy. Just you're on your own. You're trying to figure things out to just say, I'm not going to study and just watch Netflix or just screw around and do other stuff. And, um, it's really um, like it helped me kind of keep myself accountable and having that tutor was very important. In addition, like I had like resume workshops, all of these things that were available to me. But it's also like I said before, it's like you need to be hungry. You need to be asking these questions of like, how do I get there? How do I make sure I have good grades and uh, be looking for those resources. And another part, and I do this, do do this at MIT too, it's like, make sure that you fully understand what you're paying for. And what that really means is like, you're paying for these services. You're paying to get tutoring. You're paying for like a resume workshops. Take advantage of them. It's like, you know, if you have your um, healthcare and you never get a physical, it's like, but every year you get a, like a free physical. Why don't you, why are you not using it? Just do it. Thanks, Jessica. Um, we do have, or actually JP wants to ask you a question. JP, would you like to ask hey, Jessica. a question? Hello. This is very, very inspiring. I'm glued to the conversation here. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I guess I'm gonna pick one. And by the way, Karen, you have my permission to use my video. <laughs> um, you know, when you, when you compare your experience at Idaho versus, you know, MIT, how do you compare to students? You know, do, do you, from grit to motivation to, you know, how they push you, or is, do you see tangible differences? So that question always comes up by our students, which is, you know, how different are students from campus to campus? Well, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, yes, it is completely different. And even like, if you if you like moving to New York, like that was different people too. Like in Idaho, I very much felt like I was the only person working to solve these issues. I was the only Latina that cared about my grades, that cared about being in the investment club, that was really taking advantage of these opportunities. And I was like, come on guys, let's do it and let's do it. And like, they were just like, ah, oh, fine. Like Jessica, you're always doing stuff. They were interested in being part of the fraternity and the sorority and the social aspects of being an undergrad. But I was just like, no, we're here to get a job. Don't forget, we're here to get a job. Like I'm not leaving here. Uh, and you shouldn't either until like you fully like understand what you came here to get. And I think a lot of people get lost in that. Um, in terms of like the students and the, the caliber of students, 
of course it's different. And I, when I was even applying to other schools in my MBA program, I realized like where I wanted to be was like the student in like where the buzz is. Like here, people at MIT are very collaborative, like super smart. They're willing to help and they're willing, like I don't need to be like, hey guys, let's do this together. It's like they're already doing it. If not, they're already like have something like started and already like I already did that. So in a way, it's like you're being challenged every single day. Like people are motivated. People have that rigor and that grit that uh, I did not see in Idaho at all. And even in the state within itself. Um, but that's really, I think, what has made me stand out. Um, but regardless, uh, I think, you know, as you think about the schools that you're wanting to apply to, think about what that community is and what you feel like. I recall sitting at an auditorium for like a welcoming event and people were asking questions and nobody was raising their hand, nobody was being engaging. And like, of course, being the extroverted person that I am, I'm just like, hey, like I have a question, like I will respond to what you're saying. And um, you know, then people are like, yeah, great. Like I could have been like, I don't know what did they say, like the, the the little fish in uh no the big fish in a in the in the pond or i could be the little fish in like I, I forget what that saying is exactly but basically i could have been the star at that school but i was not being challenged now i'm here i am struggling but i am being challenged and pushed to the max and that's what i came here to do because i know going through this experience i will become a a better person, hopefully, and have like much more opportunities. One, one other logistical question. How big are the under division classes, lower division classes versus the upper division classes? Uh, I, I know that you're at a grad school, but for undergraduate students, how big are your classes? How big are the classes for those students? Like let's say for OCHEM or for, for calculus, are, are they, you know, enormous like the UC system? Um, I think it just depends. Um, if you have like a very, uh, you know, like software, in, like intro to software engineering, um, it's probably going to be a big class, a big lecture, like 100, like 200 seats. And now I guess since we're doing it online, like there's really no cap. Uh, but it is a hybrid model, at least the undergrads, so it's like hybrid. So what and what I like about MIT is like they're trying, they're listening to the students. We have, we get tested twice a week uh, for COVID. And um, that's like what they plan to have. Like every time you go into a building, like your card tells the building whether or not you have COVID and wh when it was last time you got tested. But um, it, yeah, it depends. So if you have intro to calculus, it's gonna be a big class. If you have like more of, you know, Python, specific um, level seven, I'm not sure, then it's a little bit uh, like a smaller class. Uh, I don't have the exact like average class, average size of the classes, but I assume it's around uh, 30. Um, but don't quote me on that. Um, and then in the, the upper class, it's the same. Like in graduate school, if you have like a big lecture, it's up to 70 people. Um, but as you, uh, if it's like a, a lab or a smaller class, then it's like 20 people. It just depends on the professor and how much, like what engagement and what they want to get out of it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? You can do a raised hand or you can send me your question. You can send it to everyone or you can send it to me privately. I do have another question. <laughs> Jessica, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, okay, I didn't see you. Um, why did you choose MIT Sloan Business School? Well, I applied to eight different schools and I got rejected to five even i'm like on some and sometimes these schools are going to use you like i'm in the brochures of some of these schools like i've gone to like their events and um they didn't even give me an interview like i felt like shit oh sorry 
I feel really bad that I was just like, no, like they didn't want to like uh, interview me. And like, I'm like, I'm like, but I'm in your brochure. Like, what are you talking about? Um, and I chose MIT um, out of this other schools that I was selected because um, they, I, I wanted to do venture capital. And venture capital, as I mentioned, is like Shark Tank and you're looking at all these different companies and deciding whether or not you're investing. And the ecosystem here in Boston, being around all of these schools, like as I mentioned before, Harvard, Tuck, Boston University, Boston College, like they're all here. And that allows like people, people are starting companies. People are um, thinking about this environment and I needed, it, it was better than like the, like I, at least that I thought like of the environment that I, the other schools that had provided me acceptance. And also um, the community, I think at least for the underrepresented minority side, like I wanted to be part of a community that was going to want me to be here. I mean, I'm sure the other ones wanted me too, but like where one where like I was being heard and the school was also listening to me and um, that's what MIT really provided. Thank you. We do have a question in the chats from Anya. How do younger students navigate networking? How do we approach finding mentorship? Yeah, so I think you guys have a problem. You guys don't really talk to people. Like you have grown up with like your phone in your hand uh, with like tablets in front of a computer. I didn't have a phone until I was in high school. I sound really old uh, and like I, uh, otherwise, like you just had to go and talk to someone. I think that how do you navigate it? Like just stop being nervous and um, go and just talk to someone. You're going to mess it up. You're going to make mistakes, but just know that and be like, hey, you know, like I was wondering if you I could learn more about what you're doing, but just get out there, just do it. And I know it's really nerve wracking. I remember like my legs would shake and I would start sweating and it was just weird. But now I'm just like, whatever, like, and in a way, I don't know if this is appropriate or not for this group, but sometimes I'm like, what would a white man do? Like if he were in my position, like it, what would he do? Like, how do you, and this is mostly like someone that doesn't have any limitations, someone that doesn't uh, think, you know, have other things that you have to worry about, like being a woman, like being a person of color, but just go and do it. Like, why not? And uh, how do you approach finding a mentor is just ask, reach out to people. I get all, sometimes I feel bad though. There are some people that reach out to me on LinkedIn and ask me to be their mentors. Um, or, uh, but either way, like I might not be able to be your one-on-one -on -one mentor, but like these are sessions like these, that, you know, I provide my mentorship to people. Reach out to other individuals that might not be as busy as I am. My goal, is to make sure that there are more people like me here. That way I don't feel like there's this burden on me to like help like everyone else, but like together we're gonna do this. And um, there are a lot of people out there, especially the, the older people that have more time uh, to do this. And I would just say like, reach out to them and say, hi, you know, like we'd love if you could be my mentor, but also if you're not free or if you're not available, um, could you suggest someone? Like I have mentees that are like, Jessica, thank you so much for changing my life. Like without you, like I would not have this job in investment banking or whatnot. And it's like, please, if you have any people that I could mentor, let me know. Like I have them on speed dial and uh, there would be more than happy to like uh, get a mentor. In addition, like there's all these programs. There's like the virtual mentorship. There's um, all these things that you need to, they are there that you need to take advantage of. One of the regrets that I have from undergrad is that we would have speakers come and we would have these like people that would say, reach out to me and, or like, let's have, grab coffee. And I always felt like, oh, you know, he's just like a speaker. Like he's too like high up for me. He, why would he want to have coffee with me? But no, it's like, it's up for you. Like they're telling you to do that. Just reach out to them have coffee, learn about that, and just move on. Thanks, Jessica. Um, there is a question in the chats. I think it's from 
Dave. Uh, Jessica, do you know whether you exper your experience has helped other students in Twin Falls aspire to attend Ivy League schools? Yeah. So MIT, I don't think MIT is an Ivy League. I think it's just a, uh, well, I guess Harvard is, but um, yeah, I think it's just like a top university. Um, but I think, yeah, I've, I've, that's like why I built uh, Alpha in the Idaho. What are my students actually, like she reached out to me, like all, I have all these people that were presidents of this organization before, they never reached out to me. She was like, hey, Jessica, I need your help. She was first asking me how to like set up an event. And I'm like, what are you talking about setting up an event? And then she told me that her internship that summer, she didn't get an internship and she was working at a dairy. For those that don't know, a dairy is like uh, where you go and milk cows. And that's great and all, but like how come this college educated Latina is going to work at a dairy versus like doing something else? So that summer we worked on, our, on her resume and uh, that end of summer, she had a conference at Alpha where she, they went to like a national convention and she networked her butt off and she was able to get two internship offers and uh, through SEO and like all these programs as well. Uh, she went to a Chase in New York and now she is going back full time uh, to work at JP Morgan Chase. And um, for me, it's like you, like you, you, as long as like you ask, there's a lot of people that are out there at, like willing to give you advice, but you just need to ask. Thank you. Uh, we do have less than 10 minutes left. I think we have six minutes left or seven, I don't know. Um, uh, just if you didn't get a chance to have your question answered, you can feel free to um, message my counselor on Plexus and we will try our best to answer your question. Uh, we do have a question in the chat from Jesus. Uh, Hi, Jessica, did you ever struggle staying motivated in any part of your journey? If so, how did you remotivate yourself? I mean, that's like an everyday struggle. Um, and throughout the years, like it's just, it's different every time. I think, of course, like when um, my dad was deported to Mexico, I was just, you know, like that was a huge struggle and kind of like shaking up my life. Um, and, but I just, I think the, the common theme of it was like my parents work so hard to be here. Like they're my inspiration. That's what motivates me is that I want to make sure that I take every and all the opportunities that I can in order for them to, I mean, I know that they're proud of me, but like for their sacrifices not to go in vain. In addition, like when I was studying for my test, like my brother went to prison and I had to figure that out while also having a full-time job at this like fancy bank and so like people not understanding what going to prison is and like in the middle of the Trump election. So it's just, it was like a lot. And um, at the end of the day, like I knew I needed to do this because now I think it's a bigger mission of like, how do we, I inspire people like you to be here? How do I make sure that you can also be here? And uh, just making, reminding uh, myself that like, what are we here in the world to do? Like, what is your purpose? And I always like in the morning do like a 15 minute meditation where I think about three things that make me happy. And then three things that I aspire to do. And it's kind of like speak into existence type of thing, but like, it's really important for me to make sure that I know like where I want to go and what I want to see myself as in the future. Thank you for sharing. Are there any last minute questions before we wrap up? I'm just putting links to the stuff here. Let's just give it 10 more seconds. Okay. All right, so just to wrap up, um, I just wanna go over, um, or thank you everybody for joining us on this MIT 
a Sloan Business School live Q&A. Before I leave, I'll let, let you all know to please download our Plexus app if you haven't yet. If you download our app, you'll be able to receive instant notifications. We will also very much appreciate it if you rate it and review our app. If you love this live Q&A, go ahead and rate it and review it on our App Store or Google Play. We very much appreciate all the feedback y'all can give us. If you have any questions that weren't answered in the chat uh, or in this live Q&A, please chat with my counselor. You can ask any questions regarding this session or you can ask questions regarding your journey to higher education. We're always happy to help in answering all of your questions. Uh, check out our Plexus Ambassador Program. This Ambassador Program is open to U.S. high school students and all Plexus users. And finally, invite your friends to join Plexus. Um, I also encourage you to check out Plexus Prime. Um, right there, you will get free unlimited tutoring. And thank you, everybody, for joining us on this live Q&A. Hopefully, we'll see you all in the next one. Bye, everyone. And thank you so much, Jessica. Well, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.